All right. Hello and welcome to the National Network to Eliminate Disparities in Behavioral Health, or the NEDS, virtual roundtable. This roundtable is on communities respond to COVID-19 implications for Asian Pacific Islanders. My name is Dr. Rochelle Espiritu and I'm the project director for the NEDS National Facilitation Center. I'm joined by our NED team, Anna, Alina Taniyuchi, Alice Choi, and Annie Van Dan, who will be supporting the virtual aspect of this roundtable. In case you are new to the NED, the NED is a network of diverse racial, ethnic, cultural, and sexual minority community organizations that strive for behavioral health equity for all individuals, families, and communities. We currently have over 4,300 members, which includes over 1,100 partner organizations or community-based organizations across the U.S., territories, and sovereign tribal nations with this within this geographic area. The NED highlights and shares new programs or interventions to build the capacity of its members and participants. And one way that we do this is through virtual roundtables like the one today. So the NED also offers a collaborative space for resources and intervention efforts to improve the delivery of behavioral health care interventions in diverse populations called NEDSHARE. You can visit NEDSHARE to find a list of resources for responding to COVID-19. That's at share.ned.net. This includes general COVID information, guidelines for high-risk populations, and information in multiple languages. We will add that link in the chat so that you can have that information as well. And we hope that you find these resources helpful to support your work. So before we start our discussion, let me highlight a few logistics for our time together. Please note that all participants are on mute. We encourage you to type in your comments or questions in the Q&A box. We will try to integrate your comments throughout the session, but it might not always be possible in, in terms of how many we get. Um, and we're also, we'll post some of these on our website so that potentially we can provide additional resources for you. This virtual roundtable is being recorded and it will be available for viewing once it's ended. And you'll also be able to download any resources that we mention or share in the chat box. And finally, if there are any breaches to the security of the event, we will end it immediately. So let's go over some of the object objectives for today's roundtable. We'll be looking at the emerging behavioral needs, health needs for API communities. The panelists will highlight community approaches to addressing API behavioral health needs. We will be also looking at approaches for addressing discrimination and stigma experienced by APIs. And finally, we'll talk about some strategies for providing culturally and linguistically appropriate mental health and emotional support services to the API populations. Our agenda today will begin with an introduction by Victoria Chow, a public health analyst from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's Office of Behavioral Health Equity. She'll provide context for today's virtual roundtable, followed by Ms. Juliet Bui, who will present a national and public health lens on how COVID-19 is impacting the API community. I will then introduce our panelists and we'll engage in an interactive dialogue. We've also received some questions from you in your registration forms and we've tried to incorporate some of your questions into today's discussion. So now I'm happy to welcome Dr. Victoria Chow to give some remarks from SAMHSA's Office of Behavioral Health Equity. Thank you, Rochelle. On behalf of the Office of Behavioral Health Equity and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, welcome and thank you for joining this NED virtual roundtable centered on Asian Pacific American communities, experiences, and responses to COVID-19 with a specific focus on behavioral health. SAMHSA is a federal agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services with a mission to reduce the impact of substance misuse and mental illness in America's communities. Sponsored by SAMHSA's Office of Behavioral Health Equity, the NED is a unique virtual network that recognizes the value in communities and community expertise, racial and ethnic minorities and diversity, and eliminating disparities related to mental and substance use disorders. The NED serves a key role at the national level by lifting up issues occurring at the local level voiced from the behavioral health workforce and community, and also by disseminating 
community-defined and evidence-based strategies for prevention, treatment, and recovery of mental and substance use disorders. These issues and strategies often highlight the vast differences in culture and language that exist within communities. Each year during the month of May, Americans across the United States observe and celebrate the history, culture, and diversity of Asian Pacific Americans during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Today, we start this virtual roundtable by acknowledging the many histories and contributions of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. In alignment with Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, our federal colleagues at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality released today the chart book on healthcare for Asians and Native Hawaiians Pacific Islanders, a report which includes some key background data on this population. For instance, in 2017, the U.S. Census Bureau estimated 21.6 million people were Asian and 1.4 million were Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders consist of over 50 ethnicities in the U.S., despite often being lumped into one category. Today and every day, we acknowledge the diversity across ethnic communities, but also the differences that exist within ethnic communities. Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders span many spectrums, including the acculturation spectrum. Some have recently immigrated while others descend from families that have been here for four generations or more. Also, some are refugees who have fled from persecution, war, or natural disaster, while others have come voluntarily to seek educational or employment opportunities, or for, for family reunification. They also span the language spectrum, with some born into English as their first language, but the majority of whom are more fluent in their native tongue. A range in English proficiency also exists across subpopulations. In 2017, the U.S. Census Bureau estimated that 45% of Vietnamese Americans had limited English proficiency, compared to only 13% of Japanese Americans. Similarly, 13% of Tongans had limited English proficiency, compared to only 2% of Native Hawaiians. Asian Pacific Americans also span a spectrum of sociocultural experiences in the U.S including racism, discrimination, and exclusion. Historically, these instances of discrimination and racism have often been directly targeted at immigrants, refugees, and those who do not speak English well. However, in recent months, Asian Pacific American communities and leaders have voiced concern for their communities as they continue to see an increase in anti-Asian narratives because of COVID-19. Alongside these anti-Asian narratives has been an increase in reported incidents of stigma, racism, and hate against Asian Pacific Americans for simply being or looking Asian. These incidents occur despite the fact that Asian Pacific Americans have significantly contributed to all communities prior to COVID-19 and continue to do so during COVID-19 by serving communities as frontline essential workers from healthcare workers like doctors and nurses providing direct healthcare services to delivery and grocery clerks in local restaurants and stores serving community members daily. Understanding how these incidents of stigma, racism, and discrimination are affecting the behavioral health of this population and the strategies to address these unique issues are critical to our nation's health. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing a colleague and our first speaker, Juliette Bui, who will provide a national framing of COVID-19 in the context of health equity and discuss these issues and their implications for mental health and mental health disparities. She is a public health analyst in the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where she oversees the behavioral health, criminal justice, and reentry policy portfolios. She also serves as a project director for the National Standards for Culturally and Linguistically Appropriate Services in Health and Healthcare, also known as the National Class Standards. Juliet, welcome. So Juliet, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thanks Rochelle. And I, um, I wanna especially thank Victoria and Dr. Lark Wong, who's my former boss and director of SAMHSA's Office of uh, Behavioral Health Equity for inviting me to join you and the NED today on behalf of the HHS Office of Minority Health. So 
It's a great honor for me to participate alongside this wonderful panel to welcome everyone to today's important discussion and also to wish you a happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Um, so before we dive into to our focus today on COVID-19 and mental health among Asian and Pacific Islanders, I think it's important for us to first consider the broader health equity context. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is undeniably an extraordinary public health challenge that has impacted so many all across the nation. And data is showing us that racial and ethnic minority populations are bearing a disproportionate burden of illness and death due to COVID-19. And specific to Asians and Pacific Islanders, um, the data we're seeing now from states like California, Alaska, even Arkansas, Idaho, Vermont, is suggesting that Asians and or Pacific Islanders account for a higher share of deaths compared to their share of the state population. And there are data from several states that indicate Asians and Pacific Islanders account for a higher share of confirmed cases as well compared to their share of the state population. So clearly beyond uh, cases and deaths, the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare a number of persistent health disparity issues experienced by racial and ethnic minority populations. Now, some of these issues are related to social and systemic conditions, the conditions that influence how you and I live and work, um, that pose barriers and challenges to being able to follow public health measures like physical distancing and hand washing, or that increase our risk of exposure to the virus and adverse outcomes. Some of them relate to lack of access to healthcare like not being able to afford to go to a doctor or a hospital or not being able to find providers that speak your language. And we know um, among Southeast Asians in particular, um, they are most likely among Asians to lack health insurance coverage. And then some of them pertain to existing health challenges, like the disproportionate prevalence of chronic health conditions like diabetes among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders or cardiovascular disease among South Asians. So many of these longstanding factors may explain why racial and ethnic minorities are vulnerable to public health emergencies. And just as during the H1N1 pandemic, racial and ethnic minorities are getting sick and dying at greater rates due to COVID-19. So, so what's behind these factors? Um, the great civil rights lawyer, Brian Stevenson says that in order to address racial inequality, we have to confront our history. And of course, he's talking about some of the most brutal incidents of hatred throughout our past. But I think also when it comes to health inequities, we should also acknowledge that stigma, racism, discrimination, conscious and implicit bias and microaggressions have and continue to play a role in contributing to poor health and poor health outcomes for racial and ethnic minority populations and also exacerbating health disparities. Now we recognize that these issues have persisted over the years throughout American history, for African American communities, for Native and Indigenous communities, for Latino communities, for Asian and Pacific Islander communities, and other marginalized peoples. And uh, sadly, this isn't the first time that we've seen racism play out toward the Asian and Pacific Islander community during a public health crisis. So during the 2003 SARS outbreak, we saw a rise in anti-Asian rhetoric in action, and action. We're experiencing it again here now as um, myths are perpetuated and blame is misdirected toward Asians. This understandably can be a grave concern to so many who are now and who came before us to pave the way on this journey to health equity and to many whose stories and histories are part of the American fabric. Not only are actions motivated by intolerance inherently wrong, but there's also evidence that suggests that they can affect health and mental health. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the CDC notes in their COVID-19 response that stigma affects the emotional and mental health of stigmatized groups and the communities they live in. And the CDC says that we should counter stigma related to COVID-19 and that stigmatized groups may be subjected to social avoidance or rejection, denials of healthcare, education, housing, or employment, or even physical violence. This is a time when so many of us feel stress and anxiety because of this pandemic, when people may fear or experience harassment or abuse, 
Um, people may be having trouble getting therapy or connecting with their support group. We may be struggling with keeping up with school at home or dealing with financial insecurity or facing challenges with isolation. And Asians and Pacific Islanders are less particularly vulnerable as these current challenges are layered on top of a number of existing mental health disparity issues. So we know that Asians and Pacific Islanders may experience trauma related issues due to historical or intergenerational trauma or immigration experience, that there may be fear and stress due to immigration status, that stigma and cultural beliefs may prevent Asians and Pacific Islanders from seeking mental health care. Now, on that note, Asians and Pacific Islanders have been least likely among all racial and ethnic minority groups to receive mental health services, and the latest SAMHSA data shows that this trend is continuing. 73% of API adults with mental illness do not receive treatment, and this is compared to 57% of the U.S. population. The SAMHSA data also shows some concerning trends among API young adults. Uh, rates of serious mental illness and reported serious major depressive episodes are growing among those aged 18 to 25. At the same time, there are strengths among the API community that can promote positive mental health, like cultural identity, traditional beliefs and healing practices, and a focus on family and community. Um, finally, as we confront hate in the context of COVID-19, we also have an important opportunity to come to terms with our collective history in America and to unite in support of equity for all peoples. Grace Lee Boggs, who I know many of you know, is uh, an Asian American civil rights activist, talks about her experience moving to Chicago and becoming connected to the African American community for the first time. And she starts participating in these neighborhood protests against poor living conditions. And she says, I was aware that people were suffering, but it was more of a statistical thing. And here in Chicago, I was coming into contact with it as a human thing. And I imagine that some may be having a similar realization as we contend with COVID-19 and health disparity statistics are meaning a lot more in very real and very proximal ways. There have been many API community leaders, members and organizations that have stepped up and united to help confront stigma and discrimination and to provide resources for the community. And you'll hear much more about that from our great panelists today. And I hope that I've laid some good groundwork for today's critical topics um, and about addressing the mental health needs of Asians and Pacific Islanders. I'm very sorry that I can't stay for the whole uh, discussion, um, but I look forward to, to, to hearing more about it later. And finally, I want to encourage everyone to, to continue to take care of your emotional and mental well-being, whether that means taking a break from the news or social media, uh, talking to a mental health professional, or staying connected to friends or family. So thank you so much again. Uh, stay safe and stay well. Thank you, Julia. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to share context for our participants and panelists today. So I'm going to go ahead and move us into the introduction of our panelists. You will please note that their pronouns are in their Zoom screen so that you can see those there. Dr. Doris Chang is an associate professor in the Silver School of Social Work at New York University and a practicing clinical psychologist. Her research seeks to improve the well being of racial and ethnic minorities by clarifying how race, ethnicity, language, and culture affect mental health and developing inclusive, culturally grounded interventions for clinical and educational contexts that integrate mindfulness. Much of her work has centered on issues facing Asian American communities. Dr. Patsy Yamoto is a feminist educator, writer, diversity trainer, and mental health advocate. She is the co-chair for the Greater Boston Regional Suicide Prevention Coalition and the chair of the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention Alliance for Equity's People of Color Caucus. She has spoken and written about her struggles with depression and is a founding co-founder of the Breaking Silences Project, which is an artistic endeavor that educates about the high rates of depression and suicide among Asian American young women. 
Mr. Perry Chan is the Program Manager for the Asian American Health Initiative of Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services. In this position, he provides leadership on achieving equity and eliminating disparities for Asian Americans in Montgomery County. His duties include planning, development, implementation, and evaluation of Asian American and Hawaiian programs. Oh, sorry, of AAHI's programs. Um, Perry is also responsible for bu budget management, grant monitoring, and other administrative and management related tasks of AAHI. Ms. Amanda Lee is the per diem adult um, and adult, older adult mental health director at the Union of Pan-Asian Communities, UPAC, in San Diego. She is also the director of field education and a lecturer at San Diego State's University School of Social Work. She has extensive experience working with cultural minorities, including API immigrants and refugees. Amanda has practiced social work in a variety of settings, outpatient adult work and inpatient mental health, home-based intensive treatment, and PACE, which stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. She also practiced social work abroad in New Zealand. And our, finalist, our final panelist today is Dr. Russell Young. He is Chair and Professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. A scholar of race and religion, he's the author of At Home in Exile, Finding Jesus Among My Ancestors and Refugee Neighbors and Family Sacrifices the worldviews and ethnic ethics of Chinese Americans. With Chinese for Affirmative Action and the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council, he helped to establish Stop AAPI Hate, a center that tracks anti-Asian discrimination and advocates for targeted policy interventions. And as you all are probably very familiar with, APIs are experiencing a rise in discrimination as a consequence of COVID-19. And so we um, have invited Russell to now share with us more about the a Stop AAPI Hate Tool and the trends that he's seeing from the over 1,700 incidents that have been reported nationally. So Russell, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, and um, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me for this important group um, discussion. I think um, the mental health impact of COVID-19 has been really um, deeply felt both the racism and the fear of the disease, um, the fear of spreading it to our elders, and actually the economic impact on a lot of our service sector workers. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening and um, look forward to the discussion. When we heard about the epidemic coming from Asia, we knew that from past history, Asians would be blamed for diseases coming over and then targeted. And so I'd like to show you um, how we've been able to document how Asian Americans have been targeted. In, um, next slide, please. So when we opened our launch center mid-March, we, we were flooded with responses of Asian Americans who wanted to share their stories. And we got over 1,900 cases now and counting. And actually, what's pretty impressive is that 10% of our respondents are elderly. So you don't think of Asian American seniors going online and complaining, but they are. 10% are non-English speaking um, Asians. And so they're using our language-based um, reporting center. You can see from the data, <clears throat> the most common incidents of being harassed is verbal harassment or being shunned. And um, these aren't mere microaggressions, though. They're really traumatizing when you read it, and you can really feel the hate and anger directed towards Asians now. Um, oftentimes, they're um, accompanied by racial epithets and slurs with a lot of swearing. And oftentimes, children and elderly are just present, and people are still attacking Asians um, despite the presence of vulnerable people. Um, if you see near the bottom, civil rights violations make up about 10% of the cases. We're getting treated differently at the workplace. If someone coughs, they're being sent home, um, if you're Asian, but if you're not Asian, you're not sent home. We're barred from establishments, restaurants, hotels, and also barred from ride shares. Hate crimes, <clears throat> such as physical assaults, are being coughed and spat upon with racial motivation make up about 15% of our cases. And <clears throat> being coughed and spat upon, I think, is really unique to the pandemic because um, I think people are 
killing Asians are people infecting us, so we're going to reinfect them. It's a public health threat. Um, and the physical assault involved cases of having rocks and Oh no, it Texas seems like okay. Sorry, uh, Russell, you just froze for a minute, but go right ahead. Um, the most egregious case occurred in Texas when a refugee family from Burma were mistaken for being Chinese. And then <clears throat> the assailant said, it's because of you the coronavirus happens. So again, this is just a tip of the iceberg. We have reports from 45 different states. Um, I think it's <clears throat> occurring nationally. Um, on a daily um, you know, basis. Next slide. Um, particular to um, the coronavirus discrimination is that Asian Americans are being targeted because we wear face masks. That's, you see 18% of the cases um, involve face masks. I think that's because of the association of the face masks with being diseased or infected. And so um, initially, most Americans weren't wearing face masks, but Asians were, and so they were targeted. But now Asians are being targeted if you're not wearing a face mask, because then you're assumed to be infected, but being negligent. So we can't win, whether we wear one or whether we don't, we're being targeted with about face masks. Okay, next slide. And you can see <clears throat> most of these occurrences um, are happening in businesses that since we're sheltered in place, that's where confrontations occur. Actually, one out of five cases occur at corporate retail sites. And so I think we not only have to hold government accountable, you can see a lot of the public sites that are um, where we have confrontations, but corporations have to be accountable for guaranteeing the um, public accommodation of Asian Americans. That means everybody is guaranteed a right to safe um, access to goods and services. But because we're being harassed so much, we're, we don't have that safe access. Okay, next slide. So as a result of all this harassment, 80 to 90% of Asians fear racial bias today. Um, so maybe other Americans aren't so aware of the issue, but I think Asians are hypersensitive. Again, we have the fear of the disease, we have fear of economic um, <clears throat> um, disproportionately being impacted uh, economically, and also we're faced with this racism. Okay, next slide. So um, just to give you a quick overview, what's going on nationally to counter this racism, next slide. I think using the term Chinese virus associates the virus with being Chinese and Chinese having the virus. Um, I think our communities are actually trying to correct the narrative, trying to stop the China bashing. And I think that's what we need to do to stop the hate and the xenophobic uh, statements. Next slide. Um, media has also been actually really spreading the virus of racism. And so you see a lot of Asian Americans using counter media, um, using our own hashtag movement. So I'm actually really proud of the Asian American community of our elected officials standing up and for our celebrities and athletes also um, taking strong stands against the racism. Next slide. And locally with a lot of community nonprofits, um, I'm working with CAA and OpCon. Um, we're building community co coalitions not only with Asian American communities, but again, with other in solidarity with other communities of color. And um, we're actually, we're really building on the wisdom of um, what happened after 9-11 with Muslim allies, South Asian, um, Arab communities, because they experienced a spate of racism after 9-11, and they had policies enacted against them. And in the same way, East Asian looking people are having interpersonal violence directed to them. So we're building all these community coalitions to um, get people to report and document what's happening, and then to try to um, avoid what happened after 9-11. Okay, next slide. So again, we're really um, encouraging people to report um, any of these incidents. Um, <clears throat> we've noticed in our incidents that a lot of people freeze after being harassed. They're, they're sort of super stunned that adults would bully them, right? And so um, a lot of times people feel like, they were victimized and they were um, because they didn't get to speak back. But having a report enables them to speak back, to speak up. And it also helps them to develop, um, to make sure that no one else gets attacked too. So we're um, 
using all these incidents um, to develop a collective voice and then given the type of incidents we're tracking, given the trends we're monitoring, we're trying to develop resources for resilience. And that's where this group could be really helpful. We're really looking for good mental health resources. We need resources for um, what to tell your kids when they're bullied, right? We, Asians now have to give their kids the race talk like other communities of color have to do. We need resources about what to do when you're harassed yourself. Um, and then also um, we're providing resources if your civil rights are violated or if you've experienced a hate crime, uh, if you need legal assistance. But mental health resources are really needed and um, we, we would like to post them and then also be able to give good local referrals. Um, so what we're doing is we're creating regional health centers, um, reporting centers, and then helping that the regional report centers can provide local resources, local mental health resources. Um, in California, we're developing strategic policies to make sure that anti-harassment um, messages are being proactively um, sent out. So that's what we're doing. Um, let's see if there's any other slides. But I do encourage this group to um, continue to organize um, in face of this racist pandemic reaction. Again, um, the racism is a public health and mental health threat to Asian Americans. It's clear to us that um, Asian Americans are under undue stress and really um, besieged at this time. And so we need to uh, organize it, uh, our own communities. And I see communities across the board organizing. So thanks. Thank you, Russell. It's helpful to dive deeper into this data that you've been able to collect and understand a little bit more about the nuances that you're seeing in there. I'm also uh, interested in hearing about the regional health centers that are being established. And so hopefully that is something that we can also provide on our NED website once you have more information about that. So I appreciate you sharing all of this data that you have been able to collect. And I think this provides the context for the next discussions that we'll have now. So we'll go ahead and move into our first question. And I know there have been some questions coming in through the Q&A and the chat, and we are going to get to some of those, especially in this discussion now with these, these great panelists here. So I'm going to start with Perry and Amanda. I'd like for you to please share how the COVID pandemic has influenced the behavioral, the mental and substance use, um, use issues of the health of our Asian American Pacific Islander community, especially because you are both working in community. So I'll turn it over to uh, Perry first. Well, um, thank you. I wanted to first thank you, Ned and Samsa for putting together this important event that we are the API leaders can come together and have a discussion on this topic. I also wanted to thank the PFS panelists for setting up this stage and provide us a um, understanding at the national level, how is the situation impacting the API community. On the ground where I work in Montgomery County, Maryland, we see an increased complaints from our community members about stress, anxiety, and depression. I mean, that is not hard to understand. Uh, cause this, these are the mental health conditions caused by COVID-19. And on the other hand, we also see reports on increasing of um, domestic violence, DV, as well as higher number of firearm purchases. So those are the things that we are seeing on the ground. And um, I think for us as a public health condition, it is important to understand, not only observe the, the, the increasing needs caused by COVID, but also trying to understand what causes these conditions. I think, uh, and when we try to investigate and look into the issue is also, I wanted to provide some context to the audience today that, you know, where, what, who is our community? Montgomery County in Maryland has a pretty large percentage of Asian Americans. Uh, we Asian American community accounts for about 15% of the county population and almost 40% of Asian Americans who live in Maryland resides in Montgomery County. And same as other jurisdictions and states, Asian American population is extremely, extremely diverse in, in the county. Uh, and the biggest group are Chinese, Korean, uh, 
Filipino, Vietnamese, Asian, Indian. But we also have other smaller Asian American populations, such as Cambodian, um, Laotian, and, and others. So we are we are we are talking about uh, the AAPI group in the country are very very diverse. And uh, in terms of age, we in the AAPI community in the country we are country, we are the largest minority group uh, that are 65 and older. And many API communities in the county are do not speak English as their first language. Uh, they're immigrant um, that may not be familiar with the U.S. system in general. Uh, we have, from our needs assessment, we understand that uh, some of the community members are lack of transportation, especially the seniors, homebound, uh, and and. Uh, facing social isolations. So on top of those, uh, when COVID comes, these are the factors that make it so difficult for us as the healthcare system to respond to the vulnerable population immediately. You know, COVID hit the U.S. and our community very quickly. We don't have time to think. We pretty much need to build a flight while we are flying. So, so these are the kind of response and needs that we see. Another interesting thing that we in the county is uh, the AAPI population has a high percentage of uh, Asian American, owning Asian American, uh, owning small business in the county. And these small business are, are mostly mom and pop store, open six day or seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. And, and these are the people that uh, our committee members, the jobs that they have hold on to make their living. And because of the shelter in place, because of the stay home order, the, our population are, are even more vulnerable to others because, uh, because uh, the financial burden that they are facing, the loss of business. These, these are the, the pictures that we are seeing in the community contribute to the, again the stress, anxiety, depression, and other DV and other 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 challenges that we have. And then the lack of information of COVID-19 uh, in language that are culturally and linguistically competent. And 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 why it is so difficult uh, to deal with COVID-19 is all this factor does not act alone. These are the complex situations that we are seeing in the community. So, so this is this is the needs that we are seeing in, in Montgomery County, and then I know that down the road we will will be in a couple of minutes we will be talking about the strategy and actions that we take. Thank you, Perry. Amanda, I know that you've been doing work with older adults in San Diego and also with general community members. Please please share what you've been seeing in terms of the impact of COVID on the on the behavioral health of the API community. Yeah, absolutely. And I also wanted to just thank everyone for allowing me to be here today in this important conversation. Very honored to be. Um, before I get started in answering your question, let me just share very briefly the organization that I work for, the Union of Pan-Asian Communities, or UPAC. It's a nonprofit organization that provides health and human services to underserved Asian Pacific Islander, Latino, Middle Eastern, East African, African American, other ethnic populations here in sunny San Diego. And the areas of focus uh, include mental health, addiction, treatment and recovery, community engagement and business development. And I have the um, pleasure of overseeing several mental health programs that serve the uh, adults and older adults here in San Diego. And many of which are immigrants and refugees, as I've mentioned, um, including um, two mental health clinics, one that specifically provides services to Asian and Pacific Islander individuals and uh, a few prevention and early intervention programs for older adults. And in preparation for this panel, I actually, um, I, I no longer provide direct services. I don't have the pleasure of providing direct services to clients, but uh, I met with uh, the, the teams of the programs uh, that I mentioned uh, last week, just to really try to get uh, insight from them as they are on the ground working with um, Asian Pacific Islander adults and older adults, and just to ask what they're seeing. And, and although this information is anecdotal, I think it's very valuable to take into consideration. And so in terms of what we're seeing, what they're seeing on the ground for mental health impacts, 
it really includes um, the uh, retriggering of past trauma. Uh, so many of the individuals that we serve have histories of trauma uh, coming from um, immigrating from their home countries where, um, for instance, uh, Cambodia with Khmer Rouge took place many years ago. And uh, with the current pandemic, they are experiencing an increase of anxiety symptoms around perhaps the, uh, the stress of what's happening. What I refer to as um, collateral damage where they're seeing family members, uh, maybe not necessarily infected by the virus and suffering that way, but maybe losing uh, employment. And so having the financial stress, that kind of thing, uh, as well as not having um, the community outlets uh, for their self-care available them, to them anymore, such as maybe visiting the Buddhist temple where they were able to um, enjoy socialization with other individuals that speak their language. So those are some examples. Um, on the flip side, I think it's really interesting to, to note um, that uh, some, of, some of the clinicians that I spoke to and they're working with uh, some younger Asian and Pacific Islander adults noticed that with this artificial pause to society, uh, it's actually given some opportunity as well um, to things that maybe we don't think about because we're maybe focusing on problems such as uh, family members who would otherwise be at work. So for older adults, their adult children who would be at work are actually at home a little bit more and they're able to spend time with each other uh, that otherwise they wouldn't. Uh, interestingly enough, they're also maybe able to engage in family therapy through telehealth services. So that's, you know, uh, capacity that they have that before they wouldn't have been able to do because again of uh, other obligations, childcare or working. So that's very interesting. The other aspect that was interesting to note is that some of our um, uh, Asian Pacific Islander individuals suffering from severe and persist, persistent mental illness, such as schizophrenia, um, and uh, we noticed a, a decrease in symptoms, actually, because the pressure of society has been temporarily relieved, and they're maybe finding a little bit more of a quiet time in space. Um, again, anecdotal, but I think worth mentioning. There's always a flip side to that, even. Many, many sides of the coin, if you will. Um, for certain individuals with maybe an intersectional identity of being Asian or Pacific Islander and perhaps LGBT plus, and their families are perhaps not supportive of their identity, being stuck at home in a stay-at-home order can be uh, absolutely uh, stress-inducing as well. So there's things to consider there. Uh, in terms of um, older adults, we've seen uh, increased isolation because of fear of going out into public and, and therefore they're not reaching perhaps their socialization centers uh, to get um, those needs met anymore. But there are um, creative ways that I'll mention later that we're trying to mitigate that. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention that this is, this is, these are strange and unprecedented times. And the one thing about it is we're all going through it. So whether it's our clients or it's us as mental health professionals, clinicians, case managers, community health workers. And I wonder, you know, are we also focusing on the parallel process for us? And are we um, looking at this as being professional and being Asian Pacific Islander? And what are we doing for ourselves to make sure we're okay as we're going through uh, this traumatic period of time and, and often are the ones that are on the receiving end of uh, hate incidents? Thank you, Amanda. And finally, we'll hear from Pata. I know that we had talked earlier a little bit about sharing maybe some of the historical trauma experienced by APIs. Uh, so if you could also integrate that into your response, that would be great. Sure. Um, again, thank you for including me in this discussion. Um, so, I mean, I, I think most, if not all, APIs have some historical trauma in our histories. I mean, from the Chinese Exclusion Act to the Japanese in incarceration to the murder of Vincent Chin because of a perceived threat of APIs to the American auto industry to now the racism due to uh, uh, and the scape uh, scapegoating of APIs in um, COVID-19. Um, 
in addition, I think it was alluded to, Amanda talked about, you know, a lot of people have the trauma of war or, tra or Perry or Amanda both, we touched on that. Um, and I mean, I believe that we're sort of perceived as the model minority or yellow para, depending on what's useful for the dominant culture. So, I mean, it, it depends on what is, is useful and that's not our, um, we did not decide, you know, uh, these labels. Um, so many of us, including myself, have PTSD and um, have strong reactions to new traumas we're experienced in this, in this current uh, situation. My father was uh, incarcerated um, in World War II as a Japanese American, and the impact of being in camp in, uh, was profound on his life as well as my, my own. Um, right after camp, my father uh, was in a high school math uh, class and the teacher told him he would not amount to anything. It's notable that my father became a PhD in mathematics. Um, so, uh, but he had a lot of ambivalence about his uh, ethnicity and that racism left him very scarred. Um, and it also is passed down. Intergenerational trauma is, a, a, you know, definitely uh, real. And it made me dif very difficult for me to understand my own Japanese identity. Um, and there's always a sense of not belonging, of being targeted. And this is in intensified by the pandemic, I think. This uh, perpetual otheredness, um, I think, is really a problem. And um, for me, I mean, I have experienced, and I haven't reported them yet, but I probably should, <laughs> personal uh, attacks, racist attacks in my community, um, particularly around um, verbal and, and shunning uh, that whole thing of, uh, I had a, a woman, I was on the street, I was outside, and a woman came by and threw her coat or passed her over her face, ran by me, and um, I mean, all she needed to do is cross the street, right? I mean, like, there's a sense of, like, you know, here I was in the middle, in the way. Um, but the result of this is my, I mean, I'm a person with lived experience and mental illness, and my own PTSD and depression symptoms have been exacerbated, not only um, by the fears, you know, about getting sick and those kinds of things, but also by the racism I've experienced. And um, I do a lot of work in the community, and this is this experience I'm hearing from friends, from people I'm working with. So um, I think that the, the historical trauma creates a, a backdrop for this new trauma, trauma that's coming up with COVID-19. Thank you, Pata. Now I know we're going to we're going to shift a little bit now into talking about some of the innovative and community level strategies that your organizations are working on to support the behavioral health needs of APIs, and this is really the meat of the conversation. So we'll go into a little bit after the hour uh, for this one, and if you can also speak specifically um, to my panelists about how culture and language is incorporated into your strategy. I think that would be very helpful for our participants. So I'm going to start off first with Pata. I know you just went, but let's, let's move right into hearing a little bit about the work that you've been doing with your listening circles. Sure. Um, so uh, I have um, had the pleasure of working with Kim Niem, who is a clinician, and she and I both took the Achieving Whole Health Body, Mind, Spirit um, Wellness Program with DJ Ida and Apima. Um, and um, we, when this first came to be, we both felt very helpless. And so we decided to establish these, these uh, experience called Listening Sharing Circles. And it started uh, being directly related to talking about racism, but it has expanded to using some of the Achieving Whole Health um, strategies um, for wellness, because there, I think there's a, a need for people to have places to process what they're going through. And this is just a very informal place. It's not therapy. It's a sharing place. Um, in addition, um, uh, I work with an organization called Asian Women for Health in Boston. And uh, Asian Women for Health is doing a series of check-in circles on Zoom for Asian women. Um, and I run the moms group on, Thurs on uh, Tuesdays at 3. Um, and it, again, it's a time when people can talk about what it's like to have kids and kids at home um, during this time and do some strategizing. Um, 
I've done things like I conducted a writing for healing webinar for Asian Women for Health, um, where people really wrote very powerfully about their own healing and about what they're experiencing. Um, and uh, the Mass Coalition for Suicide Prevention is also doing a series of uh, PSAs on financial insecurity, health anxiety, racism, especially toward a APIs and social isolation. Um, there's also launched a contest for artists who want to do those PSAs. There's a small stipend involved, and I'll put some of that information in the chat when I'm done. Um, so I've really been trying to do three things. One is hold space for people, um, and because I think people really do, they need places where it's you know the space is held to have a conversation about what they're experiencing. Um, as well as moving beyond holding space to doing promoting wellness through some of the achieving full health strategies and also creating opportunities for people to express themselves, such as the writing through healing and that kind of thing. And I think, um, you know, the, this is the non-clinical um, perspective. Um, and I think, you know, both clinical and non-clinical perspectives are really important now uh, because not everyone is sort of a diagnosed, has a diagnosed mental health concern per se. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pata. Amanda, I know that you're doing some work around with youth at risk and the elderly. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what some of the strategies are that you're employing there. Uh, certainly. I mentioned um, a socialization center earlier for older adults. Um, that's our East Wind Clubhouse. It's uh, a recovery-based model. And um, what we're doing there is uh, many of the members happen to be uh, either limited English proficiency or perhaps monolingual. Uh, these are uh, largely Vietnamese, Cambodian, um, and other ethnic minority older adults that attend uh, the clubhouse. And with the recent shutdown, although the services have not ceased, um, there are uh, adaptations that we've had to make as an essential service to ensure that um, the older adults are still able to participate in some way, shape, or form. Uh, one example, I, I, I want to give a shout out to the program manager there um, that was quite innovative, is uh, we still held groups, uh, for instance, through uh, a, a phone uh, uh, conference call format. Um, when the um, pandemic just be, you know, really began to come to light, they also prepared packets of uh, lesson plans for uh, their ESL classes and citizen, citizenship classes and made sure those were either mailed or sent home with members so that they would still be able to follow along um, to their uh, daily lessons, which really helps them to have a sense of community, if you will. Um, so I was really quite pleased that we would be able to find a way around that. Another example is um, our neighborhood enterprise cafe. Uh, it's a it has a um, commercial kitchen within it and we actually have youth from our community apprentice in the kitchen uh, and would, who would otherwise perhaps be uh, involved in gang related activities. Uh, large Karin in Burmese uh, community, uh, lots of young people from those communities and the, uh, they have a cafe that's attached to it and although they've had to shut down the cafe, they've switched their uh, efforts towards making these care boxes for uh, community members and they're, they're serving over a thousand families right now and it's just magnificent in terms of um, the the thought that's put into it with there's a there's a hot meal there's coloring books for children to keep them engaged while sheltering in place there's hand sanitizer and uh, also in terms of the language trying to meet language needs uh, there's a mental health 101 insert that's going to be put in there that's uh, in the individual's language. Thank you, Amanda. Those in-language in resources are really important to community and hard to find, unfortunately. So thank you for providing that. Perry, uh, you mentioned earlier about small businesses and uh, Asian uh, Americans really being uh, a lot, a high percentage of Asians owning small businesses. So um, would like to hear from you a little bit more about what are some of the strategies you've been employing in Montgomery County. Sure. So uh, today I'm going to highlight uh, three strategies that uh, have been taking place uh, and led by my office. 
Uh, as I mentioned previously, the COVID-19 just hit our community so quickly. Uh, but we, we still think that uh, having a recent strength, strength assessment for our communities is a key to understand where, where our communities stand, what are their actual needs, and then uh, we use this information to inform local governments, state governments, so that they can respond accordingly. That is more tailored to the API needs is, is a key. So what we do is we utilize the existing partnership and relationship with our community-based partner, faith-based partner, to do a very quick uh, needs and strength assessment. The assessment is to look at, um, in addition to language and, and, and um, cultural needs, what, what are some of the COVID related? So we learned that, you know, uh, at that time, it was about two months ago, uh, many community members wanted to learn more about um, the information on COVID-19 and they want a lot of uh, testing related uh, information and we, they needed in multiple languages. So that is the needs assessment that we, we, we uh, the findings that from our very quick needs assessment. And then another thing that is interesting, going side by side on this assessment is, people, uh, we learned that a lot of community partners, they want to respond, but they have, they have taken their own initiative and, and, and helping neighbor and communities in, in locally in, in our county. But the, the, the tricky part is uh, there's not enough uh, communication and coordination among the community and, and the local jurisdiction. So that makes it difficult to coordinate and partner. So, so part of our needs assessment, or part two of our needs assessment is to disseminate information about, you know, what is the Chinese community is doing versus uh, the Korean community, the Vietnamese community. And we set up this information, set up a platform for coordination and communication. For example, one thing that we learned through this exercise is that uh, the Chinese community wants to run a hotline for COVID-19. After a while, uh, we learned that the Korean and then the Vietnamese, they also want to set up their own hotline. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to connect all this community together so that the way that they disseminate the information would be somewhat consistent and, and but also tailored to the language to their perspective, commu respective community. And then also, as uh, we are also taking advantage of AHI being a part of the local health, health and human services department, that we are connecting uh, this group with the hotline that the county is running. So that, so that we are trying to put ourselves into the suits of the community that they, that if I were the one that do not speak English and calling this hotline, what are they supposed to do and how are we making sure that they receive uh, the most updated and accurate information from the county so that they, these community partners would be our eyes and ears and bridges to the community. So this is the, the number one step that we dive in immediately about uh, community needs and strength assessment. And then uh, also, based on what we heard from the community and, and previous uh, the data that we, we uh, uh, that we learned from from the census is that Asian American has a high percentage of uh, small business owners and again they are they are the, the mom and pop store usually with you know four to five employees family run these these are the, the, the small business that we are seeing in the community and we learn that they are working six to seven days a week 10 to 12 hours a day and the help the, the opportunity for them to receive COVID related information in their language is very very limited so we take advantage of our existing partnership and outreach network uh, that we have for over 10 years uh, we we are we actually have a database in, in our office where we did outreach and we, our staff uh, are proactively doing research on online, just looking at, you know, uh, based on this small business address and name, we try to find their phone number and then calling them and just increase their awareness of that, hey, you know, we know that 
uh, our state has a shelter in place order. Uh, unless it is the surface is essential, uh, people are not going to go out. And that also caused the decrease and drop of business. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and there's this small business owner uh, facing a lot of um, uh, financial barriers and, and because of the, of the loss of business. However, there are state and local uh, financial relief program that many of these small business owners have not heard of. So we go ahead and provide them the information and build trust with them, making sure that they understand we are not making a spam call. Uh, and, and, and tell them that we have been here before. You know, some of them, they remember us, some of them, they don't. But we, we, have, we are utilizing uh, the, the language skill of my team, uh, who are bilingual in Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, and others. Just to let them know at least uh, they would be able to further uh, look into the resources that may be able to help with their small business. Uh, and that is the, the way that we, we, are, we are hopeful that we'll be able to reduce some of the stress and anxiety on top of the disease uh, uh, at that time. So that is the small business outreach that we are doing. Thank you. And then, I'm and sorry, then, uh, we do need to move on to the next panelist oh, to share. Sure, <laughs> um, sure. I'll try, to, I'll try to loop back to you, but I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to share. Um, I'll come back, Perry, when we have extra time. Uh, Doris, I think that uh, there is some information that you had wanted to share from the Asian American Pacific Assist, uh, Psychological Association and some other information. If you could share a little bit more sure. about the strategies you're employing in your community. Sure. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm the chair of a task force within the American Psychological Association, um, Division 45, which is the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race. Um, and we are working collaboratively with the Asian American Psychological Association to produce a series of public service announcements to support API communities um, facing some of these racist and xenophobic um, attacks. And our strategy was to really target two cultural issues that have already been touched on by some of our other panelists um, that may exacerbate the behavioral health consequences of COVID-related stress and trauma. So the first is that um, we know that uh, many AAPIs, especially uh, immigrants, do not typically share distressing experiences with others um, for a variety of reasons. Um, they might be worried about burdening their friends or family members. Um, there are oftentimes beliefs that dwelling or talking about our problems um, or expressing strong negative feelings um, can be harmful to your health. Um, and secondly, many friends and family members may want to help support each other, but may not always know how, how, you know how best to help. So within the Chinese culture, in particular, which is my heritage culture, there's a, an idea of learning to shiku or eat bitterness. So this idea that life is just hard and part of growing up involves toughening up, learning how to deal with challenges as they come. Um, and that can be um, a, you know, a message that sort of tells the person, you know, just kind of bottle, you know, deal with these, these feelings yourself. So that attitude can really keep us from speaking out about discrimination. It can keep us from organizing our communities. Um, it can keep us from seeking formal mental health services when necessary, and also even supporting those who are most in need. So to address um, some of these cultural issues, our task force decided to develop a campaign the goal is to provide some concrete tools for AAPI families. Um, and we are drawing on the research literature, a team of us, um, which is, includes faculty from the University of Maryland, College Park, NYU, the Wright Institute, and Seattle Pacific University. We're developing a set of infographics and short videos to offer families um, strategies for how to talk to and support their children, young adults, other family members um, exposed to these issues. So I wanted, to, I have a slide, I don't know if we can pull that up um, right now, but some of the strategies include, um, uh, you know, talking with our family members um, around just first acknowledging that something has happened, um, validating the, the feelings of distress that they may be experiencing, um, helping them to reframe what is happening, really sending a message that 
um, what's happening to us, to our community um, around this um, race related um, harassment, verbal harassment, et cetera, is, is not our fault. And what, what the media says, what others say about us does not define who we are. And then finally, really emphasizing um, the importance of reporting um, to take these events seriously and um, really to report them to, uh, to Russell's group. So we actually have hashtagged their hashtag, Stop AAPI Hate. We really wanna help get the word out about that reporting mechanism. And in terms of dissemination, um, we are, you know, I'm always thinking about, you know, how would my immigrant Chinese parents access this information? And so our strategy is really to target social media platforms that are commonly used within Asian and Asian American communities, such as WhatsApp and WeChat. And we're we're gonna be um, we're gonna be subtitling and translating all of our infographics and videos. Um, in Chinese, Vietnamese, and other Asian languages so that they're easily accessible through um, these different channels. And then we're also, um, just to foreground this, we're also planning another set of PSAs um, directly targeting bystanders and really trying to send a message of solidarity, especially among communities of color who have also been targeted um, but because of their race and continue to be targeted in a variety of ways. Great. Thank you for sharing this resource. This is really, I know will be very helpful in hearing that in the chat already. So we wanted to move on to uh, talking a little bit about the, the APIs experiencing discrimination and stigma related to COVID. And Russell, one of the findings that you described earlier was around this bystander effect that people have reported. So could you tell us a little bit more about, about that and the youth harassment, and then we'll move into uh, some of the strategies that Doris can share um, in response to that. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> we um, are taking a deep dive into our incidents, and we notice that children and youth are involved in about 10% of our cases, but that's because youth don't report and weren't reporting what was going on in the school place before shelter in place. But a lot of times, <clears throat> um, in 60% of the cases, an adult was present during the incident. And then again, in only 11% of the time, did a, the adult intervene. So that means either the adult is a perpetrator, him or herself, against the kid, or um, that the incident occurred too quickly for the adult to intervene. All right, it's just a passing comment. Um, but we think it's really important for bystanders to actually do something because if they don't intervene, they're just being complicit, right? They're allowing the harassment to continue. They're, um, <clears throat> they're um, condoning it and uh, saying it's okay or normal to engage in that kind of behavior. Um, what we want people to do when um, they're a witness or a bystander to this type of event is to first, um, sort of set boundaries with the perpetrator and say um, that type of comment isn't welcome, that's racist. But then <clears throat> after set, you know, telling them that this is wrong, not to give any more voice or power to the perpetrator, right? And instead you attend to the targeted person, make sure they feel safe, if they don't feel safe to help them get out of that situation. And then to um, again, attend to their concerns and to give them voice over what happened. Again, a lot of times people feel powerless when they get victimized that they wish they had said something, you know, but again, these incidents occur so quickly. Um, mm -hmm. It's so unexpected. They expect it maybe on the schoolyard, but you don't expect an adult to bully another adult. And so it's only after a while that people realize what happened and why people acted that way. So that's why, again, why mental health um, professionals like yourselves are really helpful in giving people a chance to sort of debrief and, and you know, express what happened. And then I, I appreciate um, including our Stop the API Hate Reporting Center because I think, again, that does give people a voice and an outlet <clears throat> and a sense of power that they could do something about this incident, that they could do something, they could say something and then try to prevent it from happening to another person. Again, we're, um, we, we're gonna put that bystander um, intervention type of curriculum up on our website and then the other groups also doing this bystander intervention work. Thank you, Russell. So I know, Doris, that you've been doing some work around messaging. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Just Use Your Wits campaign? Sure. Uh, so one of our 
other PSAs for AAPI families um, prevents, presents some concrete strategies to respond when confronted, either in person or online. And again, our, our focus was really on um, reaching families so that family members are having these conversations collectively with their children, with their young adults. Um, and so in, in this PSA, which we're, we're currently developing, um, Professor Sishin Wong and Wing Yi Shea are going to be discussing four strategies for responding, which um, they refer to as just use your wits. So um, what that means is it's an acronym. So the W in wits um, means walk away or log off. And we're really emphasizing the message of, of safety being always the most important consideration. Um, another strategy is to ignore, and this speaks to what Russell was saying. So sometimes um, the aggressor might say mean things to get your attention. Um, we might say to a child, when you ignore and you don't give them that attention, they might stop bothering you. And sometimes walking away and ignoring don't work, and then you need to use other strategies. So T stands for talk. So talking it out could mean speaking up in defense of yourself. You might ask the aggressor to stop or talk with someone you trust later. Again, as Russell said, these things are happening so fast and you know, you, it might just kind of, the moment might pass and later on you might really feel like um, you, know, you haven't been able to let it go. So important to, to speak with others that you trust later, um, including form, you know, formal mental health supports, also informal networks. And then S stands for seek help. So that could mean getting help from teacher, principal in your school, um, another bystander who's also witnessing the event. Um, online, um, we're recommending that uh, the person report it to the website manager to try to get the comment taken down. Um, and also emphasizing a message of um, seeking social emotional support to destigmatize help seeking if you really need um, mental health support, someone who's not in your family, we really want to encourage folks to seek help and also sending a message of self care um, and in providing some examples of what that might look like. So the goal is really to be proactive, encourage families to talk about the possibility that this might be happening with their children and offering really concrete strategies for how to respond. Thank you, Doris. Are those available on a website somewhere that we can also post as a follow-up? That those are not quite ready to disseminate. We're going to have a, a rollout strategy, and I'll definitely make sure to include them and share them with with you all. And it'd be awesome if folks want to reach out and help us disseminate that when they're ready. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Perry, I think you were talking to this a little bit earlier and invite you to answer this question too about how your community and organization is addressing this issue. Sure, another strategy that we take is to partner up with the police department to create some uh, linguistically and culturally appropriate educational video. I think uh, on this topic, we learned that um, from the police department, we have not received any reports on discrimination crime or bias crime in Montgomery County. One hand, we felt it is a good news. On the other hand, we also understand that there's a suspected underreporting based on how we know the community and, and other factors that other panelists address. So uh, what we decided to do is we continue, we take up this project with the police department to um, create some educational materials and infographic. One hand is to, uh, goal number one is to build trust uh, between the department, be, between the police department with our community. Second is to increase the knowledge and awareness about this crime. Uh, as I said, the, when I talk about the demographic of the API communities, we learned that um, many of them may not understand, um, the, may not be familiar with the US system, may not have to trust with the government. So we, we are hopeful that these materials will be able to fill the gaps and, and get a better understanding of our communities. What is a hate crime, what is a discrimination and bias crime, et cetera. So uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that the, uh, my health department, HHS department and the police department are being so proactive on this from the prevention side. Thank you, Perry. 
There, there have been a couple questions too around, well, an acknowledgement that the Asian Pacific Islander community is so diverse and we tend to often talk about them as a single group. And so it's been encouraging to hear about some of the tailoring that has been happening within your organizations and agencies. And one of the questions is around, are there some overall strategies that seem to be working for the, the group in general that we might um, want to highlight? And I think some of the strategies that you all have already been highlighting do address that or are applicable. I just want to give you all the panelists just that thought that came in. Um, I'm not inviting you to answer that right now, but we'll come back to it later because I do want to go on to the next question and, and maybe you might be able to integrate it in, into your responses here. Um, we don't have as much time for this question, but I do want to make sure that folks can um, hear from you about what people can do at an individual and community level to help some of the reduce the fears and anxiety that we're seeing um, in the API population. And I'll start off first with Pata. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I think from a personal perspective, I think we need to follow the science and check our sources because I, you know, anxiety can expand. Um, you know, acknowledge when we, we do have, you know, experience racism and be able to uh, talk to people as people were talking about before and stay in the moment. Um, I also think that we need to assess our personal risk and figure out ways to take care of ourselves. I certainly know that self-care is really important. Um, and that stress, depression, anxiety are kind of normal reactions. However, if that, however, at the same time, we don't, we, we need to not be afraid to seek professional help if we need it. I mean, I, you know, I, I speak from my own experience um, and recognize that this is not a normal time and living with uncertainty is really uncomfortable. Um, the other thing is uh, just a plug for all of us to be allow ourselves space and be compassionate toward ourselves and others as we go forward. Um, you know, and in terms of communities reaching out, um, you know, to, to our community and to each other, um, especially those people who we think are particularly strong in our community, because they're experiencing this as well. Thank you, Pata. Amanda? Sure. Um, you know, I think that um, the pandemic has really simply just compounded um, many challenges that have already existed for our Asian and Pacific Islander uh, communities that uh, have mental health needs, if you will. And that, you know, whether it be uh, stigma around a mental health diagnosis or seeking treatment for a mental health diagnosis, um, you know, fearing stigma or shame, you know, all of those things. Um, I think as community providers, we just need to continue to work hard at being um, someone that the community trusts to go to. Uh, we've provided those uh, services for a long time, or maybe we're starting up and we're going to provide services. And I think that needs to be communicated, uh, especially around new barriers. You know, for instance, telehealth. We all, you know, most of us have switched to telehealth and just ensuring that uh, we're doing our part. Uh, there may be some equity issues there to access to Wi-Fi or a number of minutes that a client has on their phone or access to a laptop or knowing even how to use the technology and making sure that we're spending time uh, and effort, efforts and energy to make sure people do have access. Thank you, Amanda. Doris, what would you add? Um, I would add, you know, that it's important, we, you know, as Asian and Pacific Islands, we have so many incredible indigenous coping strategies I think we can really lean on. Um, some of my work is on meditation and other contemplative practices. So we know the, the science around meditation and mindfulness suggests that it is quite helpful um, in coping with depression and anxiety and stress in general. So um, leaning into some, some kind of contemplative or meditation practice, whether it's you know, having a, a quiet cup of tea, engaging in formal meditation, um, um, petting your cat can be extremely restorative as well. Um, and we also know mindful movements such as Tai Chi, Qigong, and yoga have also been shown to alleviate um, musculoskeletal pain, improving sleep quality, reducing blood pressure, and also reducing the severity of depression. So these are things that you can learn, um, you know, on 
online or you know practice in the comfort of your home. Um, and then the, the the third thing I wanted to offer is is really um, you know around uh, East Asian and Asian philosophical traditions such as Taoist and and Buddhism, um, where there is an emphasis on um, dialectical thinking or non-binary ways of viewing the world, and and. It's, it, it can be quite natural in some of our traditions to recognize that um, even though the world might seem like it's, you know, that it's in crisis, it is in crisis, that things are not always just one thing, that um, even as we're struggling in, in this present moment, you know, there are unexpected joys, unexpected opportunities and silver linings. So to, to ask ourselves, what are those, those, those things that we can celebrate? So, you know, some examples are, you know, at a global level, we're seeing cleaner air as a result of these large scale shutdowns. Um, in India, where air pollution is, is among the world's worst, people are reporting that they're seeing the Himalayas for the first time in their lives. Um, a friend of mine who moved home to take care of her parents during this time, is juggling the tasks of caretaking and working full time, but a blessing that has come out of it is that she's learning how to cook family recipes from her mother who's now too ill to cook for herself. So can we look for the good and the joys in this, in this challenging time? And then the last thing, just to piggyback on, um, you know, some of the other panelists urging is to engage in, in, um, in community activism, civic engagement. And I think that, um, you know, actively doing something um, to respond to this moment in ways that allow us to organize, to bring a sense of agency and hope um, can also bring bring us out of these sort of dark dark times. Thank you, Doris. And that that is a comment too that we've heard from several participants was an interest in like what what can they do in terms of going about cross cultural or um, different kinds of coalition works because. We know that um, Asian American Pacific Islanders are not the only people that are facing um, anti-racist uh, discrimination acts. And so uh, this is an open question to any of the panelists, like what, what recommendations do you have around how to go about kind of creating that solidarity or making those connections with other groups as well? I share. Yes. I think this is actually an opportune moment for um, at least, you know, when parents have to give their race talk to Asian American kids now, that <clears throat> they have to understand, and I know Asian Americans are, if you're a shame honor sort of culture, you're really aware of how people perceive you. And right now, broader society perceives Asians as being threats, as being disease carriers and infected, and as being outsiders and foreigners. Um, coming in, the yellow peril. And <clears throat> what I'd like, if any good could come out of it, is that we would then understand how other groups are racially profiled, right? And develop empathy for those who are also seen as threats, who are also seen as outsiders. And then, then we could understand why, how people who are mass detained might feel, who, how people who are mass incarcerated or mass banned will feel. And um, for me, this is a good moment where we could teach our young people, yeah, this is, America is a society based on racism, but we also have a solidarity and a connection with other people that we could gain strength, wisdom, and models from. And so um, that's what I'm encouraging. That's whenever I give these presentations, um, this is an opportunity for everybody to learn empathy, even um, empathy for the perpetrators and the assailants are attacking us we help to understand their fears and that actually helps us sort of deal with you know the bullying and harassment and the racism we're facing so um i think this is a great time to learn empathy and solidarity thank you russell i think that's a good and important message and especially for our young people as well and a reminder for our parents the last question I wanted to note from a participant was really around lifting up the um, Pacific Islanders in our API talk here. And I am aware of some recent data that has come out uh, from the University of Hawaii around uh, findings that the highest rates of COVID-19 positive cases in several of the US states, including Hawaii, is amongst the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander um, group, more actually than other racial and ethnic groups. And so I'm curious to find out from any of our panelists about 
um, anything to note around that or strategies that we should be thinking about for our native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities? So as a community mental health provider, uh, from my perspective in terms of Pacific Islanders and native Hawaiians, I know that um, spirituality and religion, there, there are strong ties there um, to you know, spiritual practice and uh, mm -hmm. perhaps there's an opportunity here to, in, in terms of community and coalition building to, to reach out to local churches and the pastors or those that are leading um, those groups and you know, trying to partner in some way, whether it is around mental health education or uh, public health information. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna speed through the next through um, a couple of slides, but I invite people to stay because we are gonna have a final lightning round question that we will ask our panelists, but we wanted to make sure we shared these uh, resources with you. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alina. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, my internet's a little unstable, so I hope this works. But um, we invite everyone here to join the NED. It gives you some updates on all the resources that you can access, including some virtual roundtables that we have in the works, similar to today's discussion. Uh, so the link is there, and I'll also add to the chat shortly. Um, we also encourage you to join because you can connect with the over a thousand NED partner organizations that we have in our network. You do have to be a member in order to access Partner Central. But this is a really great opportunity to find some um, partners that you might be able to work with to address the issues that you are seeing in your community. And finally, we also wanted to share NEDShare, which is a great resource repository for um, related resources to today's webinar and then more broadly innov innovative interventions that are happening across the country and you can also contribute your own as well if you are doing them in the community so we highly encourage you to check out that resource and again we will add those links to the chat and they will be shared in a follow-up email to all who registered. Great. Thank you, Elena. So we'd like to share, uh, to end this virtual roundtable celebrating Asian Pacific Islanders and their diversity and their cultures. So I'd like to invite each panelist to share a phrase or a practice from your own culture or identity or family that relates to this, this discussion. Um, and if you choose to share something in your, you or your family's native language, we'd love to invite you to do that and to then just translate for us afterwards. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, start with uh, Perry. Well, um, the value that we hold when we do all the COVID-19 activities, we call it a triple C, compassionate, communication, and community. So these are the values that we hold, hold up very high, uh, and hopefully it would be helpful to other audience in, in today's webinar. And thank you again for the opportunity for us to participate. Thank you, Perry. Pata. So my grandmother always said we were from samurai lineage. And um, I call on the strength of these warriors to go forward and help my, to help myself and help my community. Thank you. Russell. Um, I just wrote a book on Chinese Americans. And a lot of them said, if it weren't for our ancestors, we wouldn't be here. And I just want to recognize that, you know, there's been a history of racism against Asians, but there's also been a history of, of resistance uh, that whenever Asians have faced discrimination and epidemics, they fought back and um, they persisted. So um, I want to honor our ancestors. Thank you, Russell. Amanda. Thanks for show. I um, decided to go with one Chinese character, uh, which is Yan. Uh, in Cantonese, or uh, the rough translation is to um, endure or to sort of toughen up, or there's a value around suffering in silence. And I know uh, Dr. Chang and Dr. Jung already spoke a little bit about this. Um, the English call it stay calm and carry on. And for, for me, you know, there's a cultural context here that maybe that doesn't necessarily fit very well right now. And in fact, maybe we need to uh, have a space, as some people have talked, about to bring up our suffering, you know, in, in a way that's culturally appropriate for us. And one example is I have challenged or encouraged the clinicians in the various programs to begin screening 
our clients who may not or may not be able to or may be reticent to speak up about their experiences and, and to do the reporting on the state stop AAPI uh, reporting website. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, Doris. Um, so within the Taoist tradition, there is a saying, be like water. And what that means is while water is soft and pliable, it's also the most powerful force there is. It gives life to all things and nourishes growth. So I think all of us on the panel and, and so many participants who've weighed in, we are all doing our part to try to nourish growth in our communities. Um, water is also humble and flows to the low places that others reject. Um, so I think this speaks to humility and sort of reaching out to underserved communities, um, going beyond our comfort zones. Um, and also water um, is adaptable. So when confronted with barriers or obstacles, it, it changes shape and adapts its form while continuing to apply steady pressure. So even with, consist with consistency and time, water can penetrate even the hardest stone. So I think the message for us is consistency, persistence, um, and, and carrying on. Um, and through leaning into our communities, re, um, rely on our cultural strengths, um, we, can, we can succeed. So be like water. Thank you, thank you. I know we went a little bit over time, but I appreciate you all staying over because those were such helpful um, nuggets to hear from each of our panelists. And we wanna thank you again for the important work that you are doing in our communities. And we hope that our audience was able to take away some useful strategies from you that they can bring back to their own communities. So this brings our virtual roundtable to an end. Thank you again to our panelists, to uh, Juliet Bui, Victoria Chow, Lark Wong, and the other SAMHSA team members, and to all of you who were participating today, whether you are a NED member or hopefully plan to join soon. Uh, this concludes today's roundtable, and we hope that everyone stays safe and is healthy. Thank you.